So thanks so much for um, for inviting me to uh, uh, inviting me to talk. Um, uh, my uh, research um, focuses on looking at some of the um, uh, what we call the physiological um, problems with the cell and the body. That is um, how the the body, some of its basic functions, are not working. Um, and what we can do to understand this so we can target specific treatments that will make the body work better um, in the children and children with autism. So, um, uh, disclaimer, here's some of the treatments. In fact, uh, I think all the treatments I will talk about are not FDA um, approved treatments, that is, they're used off label. Um, this doesn't mean that they're effective or not effective, it means uh, they haven't gone through the process of getting an indication, um, but it means that it's really important to know all the positives and negatives of any type of treatment and when the treatment you know, should be used. And so you should do any type of treatment um, in consultation with a medical professional that has knowledge about these treatments. Um, or for short, don't do this at home. <laughs> so um, the, uh, today I'll talk about both metabolic disorders and immune um, disorders. Um, I'll talk in metabolic disorders, I'll talk about mitochondrial dysfunction, redox metabolism or abnormality, and um, in regards to immune dysfunction, we'll talk about the folate receptor alpha um, autoantibody and autoimmune encephalopathy in, uh, in autism, how it overlaps, and treatment with intravenous semiglobulin. So um, mitochondria is one of my favorite topics. If you don't know what the mitochondria is, it's a part of uh, uh, almost every cell in your body. Um, so uh, the mitochondria is also known as the powerhouse of the cell. It's known as an organelle, which literally means a small organ. Um, but it's inside of your cell. Each cell in your body has anywhere from hundreds to tens of thousands of mitochondria. Since the mitochondria is known um, best for making energy, it um, somewhat depends on the energy capacity or the energy needs of the cell. So uh, cells that need a lot of energy, such as muscle cells, will have tens of thousands of mitochondria. Nerve cells have many mitochondria, whereas skin cells that don't do all that much may only have hundreds of mitochondria. But you have a lot in every cell, needless to say. Um, it's very special because it's the only other part of the cell, it's the only part of the cell that has its own DNA. That is, all the rest of the cell uses the DNA from the chromosomes that are in the nucleus, but the mitochondria actually has um, its own uh, DNA and has some genetic coding um, for part of its machinery. Mitochondrial disease, diseases that are caused by mitochondrial um, dysfunction, really were uh, first described in 1988. And so really in the scope of time of medicine, that's really a blink of an eye. So that's really one of the reasons why we don't know all that much about the mitochondria. We're really just discovering it. Um, the, uh, we have learned that those people with mitochondrial diseases uh, tend to have clinical symptoms in tissues in the body that require a lot of energy. And these include the nervous system, the GI system, and the immune system. And so when we think about kiddos with autism, we know that these are some of the major systems that are involved. So it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not a mystery why the mitochondria may be involved in kids with autism. The other thing is that it's not just the powerhouse of the cell. It doesn't just make the energy, but it has um, other roles in almost every metabolic pathway in the body. And thus, since it's so highly connected with other of these other metabolic pathways, a lot of times when um, other parts of the cell and body aren't working very well, the mitochondria is affected, or um, it tries to compensate for um, that, uh, that problem. So um, it's very intimately involved in a lot of um, disorders and, and can be brought into uh, uh, or be affected by many diseases. So back in about 2010 or so, um, we had been hearing a lot that of um, talk about the mitochondria and how it might be involved in autism. So um, whenever you know you um, um, know that something's going on, but it's kind of um, preliminary in nature, one of the things you want to do as a scientist is really get all the evidence together and say, is it really pointing one way or another? 
So uh, myself and, and Dr. Rosen all got together, um, and, um, and what we said is we'll do something called a systematic review, where we found every paper that was published on autism and mitochondrial um, dysfunction. And we compiled all those papers um, and said, well, overall, what did they say? And we did something called a meta-analysis, where you take all the numbers from those papers and you combine them to say, when you put things together, there's a point in one direction or another. And we found some very interesting things. One of the things we found is that mitochondrial disease, which is a, a very, um, uh, a, a very particularly uh, diagnosed disease with very specific criteria, was uh, found to affect about 5% of kids with autism. And that's a really big number, because mitochondrial disease in the general population affects less than a fraction of a percent, less than 0.1% of the general population have mitochondrial disease. So 5% of any specific population is really, um, or any specific group, is really a big number. But what we also found is when we looked at the literature that suggested that there uh, may be markers, some type of blood markers or urine markers or such, that the mitochondria wasn't functioning right, we found that many more children with autism, a higher percentage, had these markers. So, and for example, um, elevated um, lactate was found in about 30% of kids with autism. Um, elevated uh, lactate's pyruvate ratio was elevated in almost 30%. So the numbers were much higher of those children with autism that um, had these markers that the mitochondria was not working right. And one of the things we concluded to this is that maybe children with autism may have some type of unique type of mitochondrial dysfunction. That is, the mitochondria may not be working um, well, um, but it doesn't fit into this small box that we define as classic mitochondrial disease. Um, what we also found was very interesting was that when we looked at every case of mitochondrial disease and autism that had been published, we found, you can see down at the bottom here, that the uh, percentage of those cases that had DNA abnormalities, genetic abnormalities explaining the mitochondrial disease, was only 23%. So only 23% of the time could they find a genetic defect that was causing that, and suggesting there may be something else causing the mitochondrial disease. And then there's other studies, and this study from uh, UC Davis they took lymphocytes, so immune cells, um, from children with autism and asked at what percentage was something called the electron transport chain, which is a key part of the mitochondria, and what percentage was that not working correctly. And they found that 80%, so 8 out of the 10 children that they looked at, um, had mitochondrial dysfunction. So 80% is much higher than what we found in our study, and it's, it's a very big number. So one of the things that we did to study this more, um, probably about seven years ago or so, is we used um, a new device that was uh, just developed called the Seahorse. And this is what I use in my lab. And this has revolutionized our ability to look at mitochondrial function. Because previously, you would have to really take one sample of tissue, you'd have to isolate the mitochondria, and you could do tests on that, um, that one sample. And then you'd have to do another sample. And so it would take a lot of time, and, uh, and to do control samples, you can do it at different times than experimental samples. And what the seahorse allows us to do is look at 96 samples of living tissue at the same time and look at its mitochondrial function. So it's really sped up our ability to study this. Um, it gives us all types of parameters, which I won't go into um, in detail, um, but I'll show you some of the important ones. One of the ones, one of the parameters that it measures is something called ATP linked respiration, which tells you how much ATP the uh, mitochondria is making. And, and ATP is the energy molecule that that, uh, that uh, the mitochondria produces. And then the really other important thing is something called reserve capacity, which is up here. And reserve capacity tells you about how much resilience the mitochondria has in case it's stressed. Um, whether um, it, can, it has some type of extra energy um, to, to work. And one thing we know is that when the reserve capacity goes to zero, the mitochondria is about to die, um, and the cell is about to die. So it, um, it's an indicator of mitochondrial health. 
So one of the first things we did, and this is back when we didn't understand a lot um, about mitochondrial dysfunction and, and autism, we uh, took cells from um, kiddos uh, with autism and, and control cells and we put them in the seahorse. And the thing that we expected to see was that the uh, cells from the kiddos with autism, their mitochondria was not, were not going to be working well. Because in classic mitochondrial disease, what you see is the mitochondria is working about 20% of normal. And what we actually found was when we measured this ATP, for example, ATP linked respiration, we found that, that the autism, the uh, cell lines from kiddos with autism, which are in the red there, the red line, were actually making more ATP than the control cell lines. So it was opposite. And that's how science is a lot of times. That's why you do the experiments, um, because it's not always what you're going to predict. Then the other thing we said as well, is this being driven by all of these, um, all of the tissue, all the cell lines from kiddos with autism, or was it a subset? And we were able to do, I won't go into it in detail, but we were able to divide these up into two groups. And we found that about a third of the kiddos with autism were showing this phenomenon. And then when we drafted out separately, what we found was that um, the uh, cell lines um, that had this abnormal mitochondrial function were actually making twice as much ATP um, as the control cell lines. So they were working overtime. They were actually working twice as hard. Um, but the other thing we found, which was interesting, was that the reserve capacity, which you can see over here, started out higher, but as soon as you stressed it with a uh, chemical we call DMNQ, that the reserve capacity falls way below controls. So suggesting that these uh, mitochondria are working harder, but they're more sensitive to physiological stressors and can fall apart much quicker. Um, so uh, we, we did have this model um, of this, that, that there seems to be these, uh, um, these mitochondria, uh, or these, a certain subset of kids with autism with mitochondria that are very sensitive um, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, physiological stressors. Um, of course, that was in the laboratory. What about patients? Well, what, when we first started um, looking at uh, patients um, with autism that had signs of mitochondrial disease, we would do a full workup, and part of that was to uh, do a muscle biopsy to actually look at how the mitochondria was functioning in the patients. And what we started to find is that many of the kids, again, instead of having low mitochondrial function at 20% uh, of normal, that many of them had elevations in mitochondrial function. And this is a case series we published. Um, I published with Dr. Navio. Um, who, um, where we found that complex four, part of the electron transport chain, on average was functioning 200% of normal. Um, and, and interestingly, this has also been, um, uh, others have um, published this um, using brain tissue, looking at brain tissue um, from individuals with autism and showing that um, complex four is uh, working um, higher than normal. So the question is, what do you do about this? So many people will say that, you know, um, many physicians that are um, classically trained uh, uh, mitochondrial experts will say you only treat classic mitochondrial disease. Um, but this is a paper that uh, we published. Um, I published with Dr. Um, uh, Kaler and Dr. Nazoff, um, where we um, argue that even, even um, those individuals where the mitochondria may be work, not working well, there's signs of mitochondrial dysfunction, and it may be secondary to another disease, those um, people deserve to be treated other, uh, also, um, and they may respond to therapy. And in this paper, we actually gave a, a series of different diseases, such as muscular dystrophy, where the mitochondria isn't di um, directly in the pathway of the gene defect that's causing the muscle disorder, but we know that the mitochondria is affected. And we know that those um, children actually respond to mitochondrial supplements um, because the mitochondria is stressed and it, it, needs to, it, uh, it needs help. So we argue that even if you don't find that primary reason, that maybe genetic reason why the mitochondria is not functioning right, it's okay to, um, to try treatment because it may help. And it does in, in, in certain cases. Um, and this is a, uh, 
um, just a list of the uh, different uh, supports um, and treatments that we would use for mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, the question is, well, do we have evidence that this actually works? Um, we have some evidence, and this is a paper we published um, where we looked at um, kiddos with autism that did the, um, the buccal swab, the golden fall buccal swab, um, on supplements and off supplements. And we compared to see if the supplements made a difference. And we found that, yes, indeed, the supplements did make a difference and actually changed the measurements on the buccal swab test of mitochondrial function. And this is just one example of our data where we found that not only did it change activity of uh, part of the uh, mitochondria, but it, it changed how the mito different parts of the mitochondria were working together. And here we saw that, that uh, both folate and B12 was able to modulate um, the, uh, the correlation between complex one and citrate synthase um, um, activities, suggesting that um, both of those supplements actually help these, uh, these two enzymes in the cell, these two pieces of the machinery um, of the mitochondria work uh, together better. Um, and then this is the only study that's really done this systematically um, in a broader sense to look at behavior um, was a uh, small study uh, at uh, Drexel University done by Dr. Goldenthal where they found children with autism that had mitochondrial dysfunction as measured by the golden ball buccal swab. They started them on a mitochondrial cocktail for three months and they measured whether there was a change in their behavior and whether there's a change in mitochondrial function and then took them off of the, um, uh, the uh, mitochondrial cocktail and to see if their behavior got worse and their mitochondria got worse. Now, this is an open label study, a small open label study, and they found that indeed that this is exactly what happened, that uh, with treating these children who had signs of mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, they actually improved behavior and improved mitochondrial function with the treatment. Now we'll talk a little bit about redox metabolism, which I think is really important. Um, redox metabolism has to do with the ability, you can think of it simply as ability to make the major antioxidant in your body called glutathione. But what we also know, and you see that down here on the bottom is GSH, but what we also know is that that pathway is very tightly connected with methylation, which is very important because methylation makes something called SAM, which you can see on the top, and that controls which genes are turned on and off and which enzymes are turned on and off. And it's connected with the folate pathway, which is off there on the left. Um, and one of the things that we know is that we can intervene on these pathways with um, types of folate, the folate pathway, B12 um, at methionine synthase, or N-acetylcysteine down um, in the redox uh, pathway. Um, and really, these disorder, they, this, um, this, uh, these abnormalities were really pioneered by Jill James, and it's been some time since she described it. It was 2006. It was over uh, 10 years ago when she actually suggested that there was a metabolic endophenotype, a subgroup of kids with autism that had these redox abnormalities. Um, and this is just a slide showing the evidence that supports this. It doesn't just come from Jill James's group, but now it's come from many groups around the world that have verified that these abnormalities exist. Uh, what's really interesting is um, recently, um, Jurgen Hans um, up in New York um, uh, has taken this data um, and, and um, used it to, to ask whether this could be diagnostic for autism. And he actually developed a classifier, what we call a classifier, that's able to actually select the kids with autism just based on this metabolic profile. And this paper, um, which was published, I think now about two years ago, they showed that if you take some of these measures of um, redox metabolism abnormality, which you see um, here on the right, you can actually divide up um, the, the kids from blindly, without knowing anything about them, into two groups. Um, one um, of those kiddos with autism, which are uh, the blue, and the neurotypicals, which are the red. 
and this actually works with a 97% accuracy, suggesting that uh, these redox abnormalities are actually characteristic of um, kiddos with autism. So what can you do about it? Um, and, and it's actually been many years since um, Jill James published this paper where she showed that three times a week injection of um, methacobalamine plus oral folinic acid improve these parameters of redox metabolism. Um, and then uh, we actually went back and we looked at the what we call the Vineland data. That is, we did an interview with the parent before and after the treatment um, and looked at their development. And what we found, looking at that data, is that three months of uh, methyl B12 and folinic acid resulted in a change in some measures of development, such as play and leisure skills, a whole year, on average. So this isn't uh, um, the maximum, that's on average. We can see that language seemed to improve somewhere between six and eight months um, on average in three months of treatment. And these are kiddos that were not really making their developmental milestones. Uh, we also showed that the change in uh, glutathione uh, ratio actually correlated with how much they improved. So how much their uh, metabolism improved correlated with um, how much their behavior improved. Uh, that was an open label study. So open label studies have their limitation because everybody knows that they're getting the treatments. So they could be biased. So then uh, Bob Hendrick, just a few years ago, finished the um, double-blind placebo-controlled study of methyl B12. This one was without folinic acid, um, and uh, randomized um, 57 children and showed using the clinical global improvement scale that um, and blind raters that um, they actually rated the kids that were on the methyl B12 as having significant more improvement in their autism symptoms. The interesting thing about, um, uh, about B12 and some of these uh, treatments is that we're not only fixing the glutathione problem, that is increasing the, ox uh, the antioxidant glutathione, but glutathione is made of three different molecules, glycine, cysteine, and glutamate. Um, and as you just heard, glutamate is excitotoxic. Um, and it's excitatory in the brain, and we think that Part of the imbalance in many uh, children with autism is they have too much excitatory um, tone, what we call it, excitatory tone in their brain. Uh, their brain is, um, uh, has, uh, is imbalanced, so um, it's too excited because of, uh, of glutamate. So one of the things that, we, that happens by actually making glutathione is you suck up the glutamate, you actually reduce it in the brain, and you change the, um, the excitatory and inhibitory balance in the brain. So it actually does two different things. So uh, we'll talk now about immune abnormalities associated with autism. Um, this isn't new. It's been going on for several decades. It's been um, recognized that there are immune abnormalities associated with uh, autism. Some of the first data came from looking at family histories and finding that many of the parents of children with autism had autoimmune disorders. But uh, one of the major studies that really convinced people was this study by Carlos Poirot and Andy Zimmerman um, out of the Kennedy Krieger Institute at Johns Hopkins. And what they did is they um, took um, post-mortem brains um, from um, individuals with autism that died for other reasons and compare them to the brains of neurotypical individuals that died for other reasons. Um, and then they looked to see if there was any signs of inflammation in the brain. Um, and it became very obvious in a lot of cases. You can see um, on, on the top here, these are diagrams of what we call the cerebellum, which is a part of, the, that's a part of your brain that's in the back that controls uh, movement. And we can see in A, that's what a normal cerebellum looks like under the microscope. And you can see that, uh, that it seems to be uh, very well organized. Those black dots in the middle there are the nucleus of the cells, so you can see that the cells are densely packed and they're organized the way that they're packed. They make this very nice sharp line where they change from the cell bodies to the neurons and such. Um, but we can see in B, 
this is a sample from an individual with autism. And you can see that there seems to be actually like little holes um, where those black dots were um, over an A, as if something's missing, some of the neurons are missing, and that the, the edge um, of that is kind of a little bit ragged. It's not as, uh, it's not, uh, as sharply demarcated. So then what they did is they used a stain that looked for uh, signs of inflammation, um, an inflammatory marker, which you can see in C um, is the, this black color. And you can see that, uh, um, that this kind of actually brown, this brown is actually all over the cerebellum, that there's actually signs of inflammation. Um, and that's why the, uh, the cells are missing there, that there, there actually may be some reason uh, there may be some in, inflammatory changes. What they also did is then they, uh, they took individuals with autism, they did uh, lumbar punctures to, to test the spinal fluid, the fluid that surrounds the brain, um, and um, asked whether there is inflammatory markers in that fluid that surrounds the brain. And they in fact showed that, there's the, uh, that el there was elevations and things called cytokines uh, and cytokines are inflammatory mediators that were elevated in the cerebral spinal fluid of individuals with autism. And that uh, some of the, um, the cytokines that they found in uh, the spinal fluid of, of uh, individuals, kiddos with autism, matched some of the uh, cytokines that they actually found in the brain when they were doing the histology. Really, one of the next major um, uh, papers that really convinced people that the immune system could be involved in neurodevelopmental disease was this, uh, this um, paper that was published in Nature on the um, uh, mouse model of Rett syndrome. And Rett syndrome is a neurodegenerative um, disorder in which girls develop autism-like um, symptoms. Um, and, uh, what, uh, and it's not exactly run-of-the-mill autism, but it, it has uh, those types of features. Um, and uh, what um, these uh, scientists did is they actually showed that they could cure the, uh, the mouse of Rett syndrome, which is a genetic disorder, by a bone marrow transplant. By replacing the mouse's immune system, they were able to resolve the neurological and cognitive problems of the mouse. So there's been um, um, other studies, um, again, that have gone back decades on autism, um, looking at autoantibodies, that is how uh, certain types of antibodies in our body may be attacking parts of our brain and other parts of the body. And this has been, since the 80s, um, people have shown that uh, individuals with autism have these autoantibodies that may be attacking the brain and other parts of the body. Um, and of course, uh, one of the questions is, you know, which one of these are important? Is this just an epiphenomenon of the um, immune system um, not working correctly, or is this really meaningful? Um, and this is uh, exciting data um, from the Mind Institute, where they've actually shown that individuals with, um, uh, that mothers of children with autism, they estimate upwards of about 20% of mothers of children with autism may have fetal brain antibodies that actually cross the placenta and um, affect the way the fetus develops, the fetus brain develops. And they've actually identified that some women may have these antibodies that actually cross the placenta and affect specific parts of the neurons as they're trying to develop before birth. Um, one of um, our um, 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 one of the, the disorders that we work with a lot um, um, is a disorder where we have an antibody against something called the folate receptor. And this goes back to about 2005 when uh, Vincent Rainmakers and, and Edward Quatros really described the disorder called cerebral folate deficiency. What they found was that kiddos that um, had um, neurologic impairments and actually regression usually before one year of age, when they measured how much folate was in their central nervous system, they found that it was very low, 
despite the fact that they had normal folate levels in their blood. Um, and actually, Vincent Rainmakers had described this earlier um, with, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Blau from Switzerland, and they didn't know what was causing it. They first thought it was a genetic disorder, and they looked at the genetics of the folate transporter, and they couldn't find anything. And then Edward Quatros um, identified that there was these autoantibodies that would actually hang on to the transport mechanism that transports folate into the brain and prevent it from working. Um, and this is, this is a diagram from their paper where they show the symptoms. These children were very severely affected and they had neurodevelopmental regression starting less than one year of age. Um, they could have a movement disorder. Um, they could develop epilepsy, visual disturbances, and even blindness and hearing loss. And the, what they found was that when there was folate being transported into the brain, because the brain is a protected space, everything that goes in there needs to be transported by special transporters, that the folate receptor alpha, which is the major transport mechanism for folate, um, had one or two different antibodies that could affect it. They had what we call the blocking antibody, which would block folate from actually um, latching on to the folate receptor alpha, or the binding antibody, which would bind to the folate receptor alpha and interfere with its function. And thus, folate was not getting into the brain. Um, luckily, you know, our body has certain backup systems. And um, it, it is known that there's this other carrier called the reduced folate carrier, which you can see in the middle here on the bottom, um, which is much smaller, because it doesn't have the same capacity or the affinity for folate as the, redu as the um, folate receptor alpha. Um, but it can be used as an alternative. So as this uh, disorder was described, um, uh, more and more cases were described that had autism. So um, myself and Dr. Rosignol said, huh, I wonder how many kids we see may actually have this antibody running around their blood um, and folate may not be getting into their brain. So um, through our clinics, we actually started measuring this. And what we found was that of the 93 children that we, uh, we tested, that 60% uh, of them um, were positive for the blocking antibody, either low, medium, or high, and that 50% of them were uh, positive for the binding antibody. And so overall, 75% of the children either had one or two of these antibodies in their blood. So then what we did is we said, well, can we treat this? We knew the treatment was with a special type of fol uh, folate called folinic acid or leucovorin calcium. Um, and so if they had the, uh, this uh, antibody, we um, treated them with leucovorin um, and then um, we uh, asked the families about four months later, did the child improve um, in any of these areas of symptoms related to autism? We also took a control group um, of kiddos that were waiting for results to come back, who hadn't made any changes to their therapy, and also asked those families to rate what the change was um, in their symptoms as a baseline. And what we found was that uh, kiddos that um, that were treated with uh, leucovorin calcium had significant improvements. A lot of them, about two-thirds of them, had improvements in measures of language, receptive language, expressive language, and verbal communication. Um, There's also improvements in stereotype behavior and attention that were all which were statistically significant. Of course, that's the open label study, um, which is um, subject to bias. So uh, two years ago, we published our double-blind placebo-controlled study where we did this in a very carefully controlled fashion. We randomized 48 um, children, and we found that those that were treated with folinic acid overall had a significant improvement in verbal communication in 12 weeks as compared to placebo. What we also did is we asked those were in, in this double-blind placebo control study, we took all comers, those that were positive for the folate autoantibody and those that were negative. 
And we also, we were also able to show that the kiddos that were the responders to the folinic acid were those that had that were positive for the folate autoantibody, auto suggesting that that is a good biomarker to tell you who is going to actually respond to the treatment. And what we found also was that the number needed to treat, which tells you how many individuals you need to treat to get one responder, um, is 1.8 which is, that means that greater than 50% of the kids that we would treat if they have the antibody would precipitously respond with improvements in language. Um, and, um, and that's a pretty good number because most clinical trials, number needed to feed is somewhere around four to six. I know you go to the doctor and you think when they give you the pill that the number needed to treat is one, that, that everybody's going to uh, respond to it, but it's important to understand that actually, you know, medicines on average um, really work on a small percent of the population um, as they as they are predicted to. What we also uh, were able to do is, since um, kiddos were getting speech therapy, we were able to go back and ask the improvement in language that was occurring. How many hours of speech therapy is that equivalent to? And so um, we showed that, that uh, three months of um, treatment um, with folinic acid was equivalent to 177 hours of speech therapy or about over $7,000 for this, this, this treatment, which cost about $300 um, at worst, was, uh, was equivalent to $7,000 of speech therapy. So lastly, I'll talk a little bit about autoimmune encephalopathy um, and a paper that we just recently published. So what, uh, uh, um, what we found is that um, um, certain uh, kiddos that come into our clinic and go through a big workup for many of uh, the treatable disorders, um, still they end up and they either have severe behavior problems or they're not responding. And those kiddos go on, those are the kids we go on and, and do an immune workup um, to see if there's something we can address, um, if there's some types of um, um, autoantibodies or other types of immune mechanism affecting the brain. Um, and in uh, this study, uh, we, uh, our, our normal protocol is we um, do a number of different tests, including autoantibodies to the brain. Um, uh, called, uh, it's called an encephalitis panel um, in some labs, carineoplastic panel in others. Um, and we also did other um, testing such as the Cunningham panel, which um, looks for um, autoantibodies to the brain and also looks for something called CAM kinase, which tells you that, which validates that those antibodies may actually be affecting the nerve cells. Um, and out of the uh, 82 patients we screened, 60% of those, um, we uh, found evidence that they may be, um, uh, they may have evidence that they could go on to actually um, have an intervention such as IVIG. Uh, and so 49 were recommended, 47 IVIG was ordered, um, about 77% of them actually received the IVIG. Of course, it's very hard to get sometimes. So there's uh, there was many, you know, in, in, uh, insurance denials and appeal processes that sometimes went on for months. We started out uh, treating these uh, children with two grams per kilogram um, uh, per month, given over two days. So uh, seventy, and, and this is a diagram, a chart that shows where we started as far as what we prescribed. So 74% of the time, we prescribed um, two grams per kilogram per month, divided over two days. Um, and uh, this is where we ended up. And I won't go through it in detail, but what you can see is that uh, where we ended up with the children is that most of them, 37% of them, stayed um, with that dose but many of them had to have the dose adjusted. And so it's just a, you know, um, I think a, 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 an example of um, how nuanced and kind of complicated this is and that not and one size does not fit all. And it's something they have to go ahead and adjust depending on the patient, depending on the side effects, and depending on the effect, how long the effect um, 
lasts. When we asked parents about what improved, the majority of them, 58% of them, said it was communication and language. 35% uh, of them said that it was aberrant behaviors. Um, when we gave them these lists of symptoms, uh, the number of symptoms um, that, uh, uh, that were reported usually to um, improve was uh, two of these symptoms, in, um, which was reported by 35% of the uh, parents. Um, we also um, did some objective um, uh, checklists uh, before and after treatment, and so we could see where symptoms improved. And so with IVIG as a group, these children had some improvements in something called the social responsiveness scale, which looks at autistic symptoms, um, particularly in cognition and mannerisms. But there was really kind of more dramatic, I would say, effect on the aberrant behavior checklist, which measures aberrant behaviors like irritability, lethargy, which is also known as social withdrawal, hyperactivity, um, aberrant speech. So all of those really improved, as did the total score overall with IVIG. Then one of the things that was very important to us was to ask, is there some way to predict who is going to respond and who isn't going to respond? And so we went back to the Cunningham panel because that's what uh, most um, individuals had. And we actually found that, that two of the antibodies in the Cunningham panel, both the anti-D2L uh, receptor antibody and the anti-tubulin antibody seemed to be predictive of who was going to respond. There were definitely higher titers than those that were responders to IVIG. And we actually did correlations and we found that the aberrant behavior checklist actually correlated with these titers. That is the change, the improvement in the aberrant behavior checklist correlated with um, the, uh, um, these uh, titers. So we think that we are looking at a biomarker which can actually tell us which of the kids that will respond to this treatment. When we looked at how kids responded, this is, looks at change in the aberrant behavior checklist along the x-axis and change in the SRS or social response to the scale on the y-axis. We can see that the green, there was many children that had um, improvement in both, uh, but there were some kids that um, only had improvement in behavior, which is the blue, and some that only had um, improvement in social responsiveness, which is the yellow. We also asked in those that did respond, how fast did they respond? So we graphed out their change in um, behavior as, um, uh, as uh, uh, by the score in the total score in the average behavior checklist. And you can see on the left, it's the kiddos that were responders, the right, the kids that were non-responders. On the left, you can see that it, it varied. Some kids had a drop in the ABC very quickly, and some took a very long time. Also, we had uh, several examples, which uh, um, we uh, cases that we uh, reported in this paper um, that we thought were notable. And this one, this is a kiddo that had mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and uh, we had identified that first when he was about six years of age and started treatment for mitochondrial dysfunction. And at that time, his behavior significantly improved with that treatment. But then something happened and he had a abrupt uh, worsening of behavior, and uh, he was positive in his Cunningham panel, started on IVIG. Um, and uh, he had significant improvement then, not only in behavior, but in social function too. And one of the interesting things was, um, we have a picture um, of his handwriting right before he started IVIG, after five years of occupational therapy, you can see that he can't print along the line. Um, and after two days of IVIG, you can see improvements, significant improvements in his handwriting. One of the things that's a cautionary note is that since this child had um, mitochondrial dysfunction, we measured um, measures of, um, of mitochondrial function before and after the IVIG. Um, and what we showed is that the IVIG did tend to stress the mitochondria and worsen, that is, increase these markers of mitochondrial dysfunction. And it's a cautionary note because I've had other patients 
that have started doing poorly on IVIG after a while, and then you find out that they may have stopped their mitochondrial supplements. Um, and so it's important to make sure you, you um, support the mitochondria if it needs to during um, IVIG therapy. This is a case two uh, we presented, which is the first time the N-type uh, calcium channel antibody has been reported in autistic regression. This was a, a particularly interesting case because this kid regressed after three years of age, which is um, uh, very unusual. And this is a, another interesting cautionary note of a child that was on IVIG every four weeks. We tried to change it to every six weeks, and her behavior um, went through the roof. You can see that the average behavior checklist went from 80 to 120. Um, uh, so um, it increased uh, significantly. Um, and um, also the CAMP kinase, which had come down, the measure on the Cunningham panel um, for uh, immune activation had come down with IVIG, also went up. We started her back on IVIG every four weeks and it improved behavior, um, not as quick as the behavior worsened, um, but she improved after that. So um, in conclusion, um, uh, just as a summary, I'll point to some of, if you want to do some further reading, we put together some papers that summarizes some of this. This is a paper that Dr. Rossiol and I wrote in 2014 about how, do you, how many of these metabolic cycles are connected and some of the treatments that you can use to intervene. Um, and then uh, this is a paper we published two years ago where we reviewed all the medical comorbidities associated with autism and what um, evidence is, what scientific evidence there is um, that you can treat them and what those treatments are. So with that, I thank you for your attention.